This is something that they used to only teach to advanced researchers, but after working in the public library for decades, on the reference desk and then later in the heritage room, which is the genealogy collection in Athens where I was, um, I realized that people needed to be, to be taught to think like this early on as their beginning because we miss a lot of important information if we just cursory, give cursory glances to our information. So y'all are gonna do some work today in this session and I'm gonna try to skim through it. I'm gonna talk about this quickly so you've got your brain in the right mindset. You start with yourself and you work back when you're doing research. You put people in a place at a time. You must fully document each generation before researching the next one back. You've got to evaluate the reliability and validity of information from more than one source. Y'all know that one good source is not adequate to prove anything, right? Okay. And you cannot make assumptions, and that's the one I get in trouble with all the time. Uh, you've got to understand the reason the document's created by who and um, why and what. I mean, people used to complain to me years ago when they'd come in to do census work, and this was before stuff was online, that they didn't understand why their ancestors weren't in alphabetical order on the census. I had to very patiently explain that we don't live in alphabetical order, unfortunately, so no, they're not going to be in alphabetical order. Um, and when a record exists, what other records might be created that either precede that record or follow that record? So, you know, when you find something about an ancestor, we get all excited, but sometimes we don't really think through, okay, if this record came along, what other record might there be? Death certificates. Okay, so I put one in your handout I wanted you to think about. Has everybody got their handout out? I'm going to talk about this one first, and then you're going to look at the one in your handout, and I'm going to ask you questions about it. Okay, a death certificate is, and of course, keep in mind, I'm lo we're looking at a digital image, so it's not technically an original. You know, and this is a, a digital image from a microfilm, so it is at least third generation. So keep that in mind, but these are about as good as we've got to work with these days. So it's not technically an original record, but for today's purposes, we're gonna kinda consider it a digital, I mean, an original record. So look at the primary information on this record. Can everybody see it? Oh yeah, it's pretty clear, good. Okay, I'm getting ready to ask you, and this is from the death certificates that Virtual bought at the Georgia Archives. They're not all there, but some of them are. What is the primary information on this death certificate? The information about the death is primary. The date, cause, that kind of thing. The name of the informant is primary information. The date the certificate was filled out is primary and the name of the doctor. Most of the rest of this is secondary information. Okay? Let's look at it again. What information is missing from this document that we might have reasonably expected to be on there that the informant did not provide? Let's look at it again. Huh? The date of birth, because the father is who is giving this information. So you would think the father would have been able to provide the death. And this, of course, is a 
death of a young doctor, well, relatively young, um, in Columbus who died of the Spanish flu. I thought that was appropriate for what we've all been dealing with lately. So I thought we'd do the one 100 years later. Um, yes. Yes. Um, and um, he's single. Now, based on that information that we already had, where else can we look for more information about this guy? Newspapers, cemetery records, because the name of the undertaker was given, the cemetery was given. If they've done cemetery books from Muskogee County, Georgia, you could do that. You could see find a grave, billion graves. Based on his age, what other major record that would provide a lot of good information that World War I draft registration, exactly, and probate records. He died. If he had a will or he didn't have a will, he probably has a probate record, okay? Now, this is an excerpt of a, one of many documents and a probate file in Clark County, Georgia. Um, and I'm, kind of enclosing some of the primary information that we're going to look at, because we're not going to look at everything. Um, but we're talking about the estate of Alicia Tiller, deceased, and it's talking about his wife and minor children. And then on the other side, we're talking about money to be paid by administrator, and then it's listing witnesses, and it's giving a date that that piece of paper was filed. And if we just left it there, we might miss some important clues, right? And we're talking 1863, so I mean, one question that ought to pop into brain, to your brain is, did he serve in the Civil War, and did he die? I mean, is it related to that, okay? I mean, it's not like we didn't lose hundreds of thousands during that war, so. Now, this is kind of the transcription. So we've got the name of the wife, and how many children does he have? Three minors, and does everybody know what the age of minor was in Georgia in 1863? If not, that's something you have to look up because it makes a difference. You see what I'm saying? Because that gives you a clue about the age of the kids. And this other side, this is the stuff from the other side. You have several more clues. We're listing an administrator. Okay, what does that tell you? Either that he didn't have a will or if he had one and an executor had been appointed, the executor refused to serve. Okay, so when you see terms like that, that is another thing you write down, I need to find out, did he have a will? And if so, why is it listed as going into administration as opposed to letters testamentary, okay? And then you've got these, um, the date. So you've got the first day of August, 1863. So you know he died before then. So on your little notes and your timeline, you're gonna say, Okay, I know he was dead by this date, right? So you work back from there. But if you just skim, skim this, because let's face it, the interesting part of this is all these personal belongings that are listed on that whole page, right? That's the kind of stuff we usually get excited about. But that's not going to get you all the information you need. And those witnesses, were they neighbors? Were they relatives? 
you know, if you're doing cluster or fan club research, which you should be doing, which fan club means friends, associate, neighbors, then those are people that you're going to want to add to that list of people you play with, okay? So I went to the Georgia Historic Newspapers Collection, which is totally free and incredible for any of us who have Georgia ancestors. And I searched the August 26th, 1860, well, I put in the name Alicia Tiller to see what came up. And I put in the original parameters were June to December of 1863. I wanted to see, you know, the legal notices because we require these things called legal notices. They have to be done X amount of times. These are required by Georgia law. So this gives you additional information you can get. So as you see, there's a big hole cut out. Luckily, it wasn't the part that I needed. <laughs> Sometimes it is. <laughs> So we know something is missing from both sides of that page. So this is the legal notice I did find. Um, and keep in mind, this database is totally free and they're adding thousands of pages all the time. So just because you check it this year and play and you haven't done it in a while, go back and search again. And don't limit it to where your folks live. Now for legal notices, yes, but for other, like if there was a fun crime that's very sensational, they might be halfway across the state, okay? Huh? The Georgia Historic Newspapers database is totally free and it's part of the Digital Library of Georgia. So we've got this notice and you see that, I thought I got my pointer out, but evidently not. Um, you notice down there, oh, this is really hard to read, sorry. So you've got the date on the notice for Alicia Taylor that August 5th is the date that this notice is fine. And it says all persons holding demands um, against Alicia Tiller. This is where you put the notices asking for creditors to come forward and anybody who owes money to come forward and pay the estate. So that's, and the administrator is Kimmy L. Smith and his Millstone, he lives at Millstone Post Office in Oglethorpe County, Georgia. So this is a probate record from Clark County so this is telling you that there's an Oglethorpe County connection as well. Oglethorpe is an adjacent county. So that's one more little piece you jot down. And if you just didn't really pay attention to this, thinking, oh, well, that's the standard thing. You see what I'm saying? You might have missed a clue about Kimmy L. Smith. And the paper is noted I mean, is dated August 26th because you had to do these things for a certain period of time. I think Georgia was four, four times and every county had a legal organ where these legal notices were posted and that, that often was a major stream of income for that newspaper that was designated the legal organ because the county had to file these notices and had to pay them for them. And sometimes a county didn't have a newspaper. I mean, we're talking Georgia, rural, right? So they would designate a legal organ in another county. So there is a legal organ because they had to do these notices. So you need to look at a nearby county that had a newspaper to determine what was the legal organ. Are y'all seeing how this one little thing leads to a lot of stuff? Okay, so now we're backing up. So I had done the June through December, and here's another one I came. Now this is where Kimmy Smith, and notice in this one he's being listed as Kimmy J. Smith, 
and I'm assuming it's man because of the time frame. You know, there wasn't much that women got to do uh, except under extreme circumstances during this period. But he's applying for letters of administration. And so you could go to that probate court and see, you know, in Clark County to find out what, you know, the circumstances were. Had there been an executor that didn't serve or whatever. But regardless, you now know this. And so he is posting notice. The ordinary, which was the name until 1972 of our probate judges in Georgia, which confuses the bejesus out of... Virginia folks, because ordinaries are taverns, and they used to see ordinary court records, and they thought we were talking in Georgia about tavern records or bar records or, you know, whatever. It's interesting. So he's giving notice that he's going to appoint this guy by a certain time. So I'm listening. Probably a man, because that's what I'm saying. Alicia was the male, because it said he had a wife and children. And But Kimmy, but as I mentioned, in 1863, there are not many women who got to be executors or administrators of a state. Yes, yes. Probably because the question, yes, thank you. The question is would a probate record be created for a woman? And yes, because somebody had to deal with the property. And, and see, what, what we were looking at was actually only for the year's support. In Georgia, you had the option, I mean, because some estates didn't get settled real fast. And particularly because this guy didn't have a will, you know, nobody, had, he hadn't told anybody how he wanted stuff dispersed. You see what I'm saying? So you, but a woman would have the same thing. And if they were minor children, there were probably guardianships and other things. And keep in mind that guardianships could be done for adults and guardianships could be done. So it's back to this thing, you've got to understand the terminology. So this administrator, uh, Kimmy, mm -hmm. um, would he have some type of legal authority? I mean, would he be an attorney or would he just be somebody? No, he could be anybody. He did not have to be an attorney. And that's one of your questions is who is Kimmy J or Kimmy L. Smith and why is he applying to take care of this estate? Because it's work. You see what I'm saying? So that's one of the questions you're going to ask uh, from this, this little notice. This what? 10, 15 lines in the newspaper. So now I know that that other thing said May 6th, and I'd searched June to December, so I had to expand my search dates in that Georgia Historic Newspapers back to January or further back. And I extended it on the other end when I went to January 1863. I went to December of 1864 just to be able, sure I picked up anything that was going to be in the paper about the settlement of this estate, okay? So now we're back to this after expanding the search. And again, we know that Kimmy has, is Oglethorpe County because it told us exactly which district he was in in Oglethorpe County, Millstone. So I would get out the map because I'm a visual learner and I need pictures, you know. So those are the kinds of questions we would use from just those few snippets of this one file. Now we're going to another one. This is one of my favorite ones. 
um, because it is a perfect example of what happens if you only look at what a document is about and don't read it carefully and don't think about what it is telling you. And a good friend gave me this one a number of years ago because it solved a mystery that had been in her family for 30 some odd years where they had been looking for a document that proved the marriage of Alexander Torrey and Falby Horn. And this is a document. This is a deed for the sale of a slave child in Hancock County, Georgia. And it actually is going to give a document. I mean, this document is going to give the first documentary proof they had. They had circumstantial evidence, but nothing documentary that said Falby Horn and Alexander Torrey were married. Because they saw it going through these files, you know, and through the deed books, and they, it was about a, a slave sale. So why, I mean, and they were looking for the marriage. Do you see what I'm saying? You cannot, if you find a document about anybody in your family, do not just skim over it because it's not about what you think you're looking for, okay? So here's kind of a transcription. Know all men by these presents that we, Solomon Roundtree and Hugh Taylor of the state of Georgia and county of Hancock, for and in consideration, you know, this is that boilerplate language, of $200, now see that part is interesting, do bargain and sell and by these presents have bargained and sold unto Benjamin Jenkins of the state and county aforesaid, a certain Negro girl known by the name of Faraby, aged about 10 years, which said Negro girl, oops, the said Benjamin Jenkins doth purchase on and on and on um, and in testimony whereof and they give a date and their witnesses and again that's fan club fodder right and I signed the within bill of sale and this is after that original document because the first one was done 28th day of March 1800 I mean 1803 excuse me and then the second piece this is kind of recorded later is when they assigned this to Alexander Torrey, husband to Falby Horn. This is the first document that they had found in looking for 30 years. This is Mary Ann Abbey's ancestor. She's one of the ones looking. You know she is super competent. And they had missed this. So I'm just saying, expert, experienced researchers miss things if they don't really look at stuff. And then they recorded this in October of 1804. Now, so what are the relationships? Oh, and when you're doing transcribing, just as a note, you're supposed to space things exactly and spell them errors and all exactly as they're written. So I'm just saying that's one of the things to keep in mind when you're doing a transcription or reading a transcription because sometimes it looks like it's weirdly spaced and it probably is because that's how it was done on the original. So here are some of the people involved. So what are some of the clues and relationships that this bill uh, the sale provides? Uh, the place is Hancock County, Georgia. The dates are March 1803 to October 1804. Farabee, and it might be Phoebe, but you know, as we know, spelling is not <laughs> consistent. Spelling is ignored in genealogy because if you get locked into a spelling, you're going to miss people. Um, so Farabee is aged about 10. Falby Horn is the stepdaughter of Benjamin Jenkins. So that tells you her mother was married before or else Falby is out of wedlock. So either her mother's married name or Horn or her maiden name is Horn, right? So that gives you a clue to find Falby's mother, right? Are y'all following me? I'm seeing some people nod and others look like, oh, I wish this woman would shut up. <laughs> Uh, and Falvey Horn is married to Alexander Torrey. You know, this is the real gem that this provided. But you've also got list of witnesses and grantors. You've got, are these people neighbors? Are they relatives? 
if Roundtree and Taylor, who are selling Fairby, are not Hancock Countyans, where are they from and where did Farabee come from? Can we find marriage records for Falby's mother to Benjamin Jenkins? And if we do that, that's going to give us a clue because if she was already married, it's going to probably say Mrs. You know, personal name and then Horn. You see what I'm saying? Not always, but that's a clue that sometimes people are kind enough to give us. And you're also going to want to look at the tax records for Hancock County, Georgia, Jenkins, Tory, and others, because that may give you a clue as to where Fairby came from, and it's also going to give you a clue about the other people. This is, a, I mean, I took some military records. And I have no idea why I picked this guy, but, you know, I did, and it turned out to be kind of fun. So I was really looking for, oh, I know why, because it's a McElrath, which, and I'm always looking for McElreese. Some things to remember when reading records, you've got to understand what the terminology means. So this is um, his declaration as he's coming in to the military. Um, and this little note on here, this handwritten note, says recruit entitled to bounty provided by Circular 27. Uh, Provost Marshal General's Office. All of a sudden I went blank on what PMG meant. Um, and the date, and it says received from the second auditor. So what is this bounty mentioned on this? And what does Circular 27 really tell us? So you've just added things. So you're wanting to find out what kind of bounty James was going to be getting. So here is where I Googled Circular 27, Provost Marshal General's Office. And I got to this in the War of the Rebellion, a compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate Armies, official records of the Union and Confederate Armies. You need to be aware of this set of records. Also know there is a hundred volume supplement that has sent been published from all the late reports that got submitted. This is reports and information submitted by both Confederate and Union officers and gives you a wealth of information and they're digitized and searchable and easy to use but you get really good information but be aware of it because if you've got civil war era ancestors you're looking for you have no clue what you might turn up so we got to the official records and it's typically called the or which is a much easier title than that long thing i just read you right so when you hear somebody talk about the OR, you see it mentioned in articles, now you know what they're talking about. And don't forget that 100 volume supplement that was published by Broadfoot that you can probably find in libraries in various places. And when we read this circular, we now know that he enlisted for one year. And now we're back to another one of his records. This is in the compiled service records for this James McElrath. And notice that he was born in Muscovia County, Georgia. Where do you think that is? Muscogee County, Georgia. I mean, to my knowledge, Georgia's never had a Muscovia County. Remember, we've already talked about how great spelling is and stuff. So this is giving you all this information. He, he, it tells you he was born in Muscogee County, Georgia. He is enlisting on the Union side for Texas Cavalry in New Orleans. So did the rest of his family move with him to New Orleans? You know, and why is he enlisted in Texas Cavalry? Were they just there recruiting? Do you see all the questions? that should be going through our minds every time we look at these things because you don't know what is going to yield really good pay dirt. 
And regardless, it's going to tell you a lot about your ancestor. And I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in just the dates for my people. I want to know what they were doing and why they were doing it. You know, so could this, this document right here help reinforce what the migration trail might have been? Because did he do this move alone? Did he move with his family? I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Are y'all following? Okay. And then we're going to another piece in this compiled service record. And we're getting more information. Now, we've just taken this one snippet. So we've looked at different progressions. Remember I talked earlier about the fact that when you find a record, you need to see what could have come before or after. So now that we know that he served, where else could we look for where James McElrath ended up after the Civil War? Exactly, the pension files. And even Confederates got pensions, but not from the U.S. government. So if you have a Confederate ancestor, you're going to want to look in the state records because they started doing, most states, the first thing they started doing, and this wasn't immediately after the Civil War, but they were done to pay for artificial limbs because, as y'all I'm sure are aware from movies and books and stuff, there were a lot of amputations because that was the best way they thought to prevent gangrene and people dying. So they just whacked off whatever appendage was injured. And um, so that meant a lot of people could no longer really support themselves if they couldn't really move. So artificial limbs were one of the best things. And there's a great book published by the University of Georgia Press if you're really interested in the socioeconomic um, consequences of this called Empty Sleeves. It's really interesting because it compares the results of the amputations in the U.S., I mean on the federal side and in the southern side. Um, so, now, these are two books that are really, really useful if you have folks that were around um, early, you know, kind of early. So one is The Passports of Southeastern Pioneers from 1770 to 1823. Um, and then the other one is Passports Issued by Governors of Georgia, 1785 to 1809. How many of you ever thought about the fact that you had to have passports back early. I know y'all did. Y'all are abnormal though. <laughs> huh? Passports to leave here and go into some place else. Okay, so they were required to go into the areas that were not part of the Georgia colony, I mean the, the British colony, a British colony, or later, the United States, you had to have permission. See, in the one on the, um, your left, it talks about to go into Indian land, Spanish land, and other land, passports for Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Mississippi, Virginia, North, and South Carolina. I'm sure they did, because these were other nations. These were not things that we owned, I mean, so, you couldn't just go to this other place, so look for passports. And this is a brief expert, I mean excerpt, gosh, I can't talk, um, from Family Search. This is full text now on Family Search. They have 400,000 full text books, y'all, in their digital library, so. Y'all better be playing in family search on a regular basis. And remember, it's all free. Um, so whereas Jacob Ray informs us that he wishes to go to the inhabitants of Big B to see his father that lives in that county. And it t basically what was required that you get personal references that said you were a good guy and honest and above. So you've got these two people who are justices of the peace 
and it tells you the recommendation was granted 22nd April 1802. Do y'all know where Big B is? Well, it could be Mississippi or Alabama, but it usually, and it's spelled a gazillion different ways when you look at records from this time, but it's where a lot of people migrated to the area of the Tom Big B River. So see what I'm saying? This again, so you know that this guy's father has moved there. So is Jacob Ray here with his family? You know, did he stay in Wilkes County, Georgia with his family and this is part, and who else moved with his father to this area? You see one of migration trails? Remember, we're a very mobile society in this country in spite of what we think today. I swear, with what they had to go through to move back then, I think they take the cake for being mobile. And this is one, how many of you have heard that there are no records of African Americans prior to the Civil War? Okay, it's a myth. It's a lie, don't believe it. There are records of almost everybody somewhere. So I'm just saying, this is an example. Um, this is papers relating to specific states and deeds of, co of session of Western lands. Well, excuse me, it's rows in. We're going to the inspection rows of Negroes is what we're doing. And there are two books that are digitized. And these are from 1783. These are lists that usually include the name, the age, the description, the destination, and claimants to the blacks as slaves, as well as the name of the ship on which they were to travel, its captain, and remarks, giving you history. And I put these in your handout there in the back because I want you to see what they're like. These were people being evacuated. Many were going to Canada or other places um, where the British were still in control after the Civil War. So you get a clue about people. So where, where you've got, if you're able to get back to this colonial period, you may find family members who are listed in here. So look at your handouts for pages five and six. Huh? What did I say? Oh, yes, Revolutionary War. No, I, my first question was, have you heard that there are no records for African Americans prior to the Civil War. But the second part, I was trying to talk revolution, and Susan gave an excellent example of a very long little book on all the free black heads of household in 1790. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a whole book. It's not like three pages, people. So, you know, we are lucky. We live in a country that keeps records, and I know we fuss about bureaucracy and records, but you know what? It allows us to learn the truth. And we're getting close to time. Okay, so I want you to look at those two pages, and you will notice that one of them is talking about the ship and all of that information. And then the second page is giving you the remarks. So you're getting the name of the ship's captain. I've, at the bottom of that page, I've given you, great, did I pick up the wrong page? I've got it on here, because this is what y'all have got. So on page five, you're going to see that it's listing the vessels and their commanders, where that vessel is going with these passengers, the Negroes' names, ages, claimants, that's the names and the residents, and the names of the person in whose possession they now are. It doesn't mean they're slaves, but these, these records also are, these ships were also taking formerly uh, bound servants to places where England, 
and I've given you the source citation, and I've given you the column headings because they're hard to read. But as you go across, you'll see all of this information. So if we go to that first one on page five, it looks like Nancy Irvine, and I'm not gonna try to be sure I'm getting the names right, because if I was researching these, I would try to get it right. But it says she's 32, she's a fine winch, and winch was what they called um, an African-American uh, female. And then Sally, who's 12, is a fine girl. Tom is two, and he, Dio, you'll see that on censuses, you'll see it in other records, means ditto. And sometimes it's written out ditto, but you'll see Dio a lot of times on records, and that's what it means, because for years it confused me until somebody said, well, dummy, it means ditto. And I went, okay. And then the next one, I think his name is Sambo Trier or Fryer. He's 24, ordinary fellow, I think is what that says. And then Tom Rivers, age 43, a stout fellow. And it tells you over here in the bottom, you know, Captain McRae has got the first three. And then Daniel Ray has got the next two. And then if you go to the remarks, I had to write it out so I could kind of understand it. It says on the top three that they were formerly slaves to Charles Rents, South Carolina, and they left four years ago. And we don't know how they left, but, we, but this, if you're trying to track people in different areas, can give you. And then on Sambo Fryer, it says formerly slave to George Fryer or Trier. I'm not sure whether that's an F or a T. I'd have to really work on that guy's handwriting to figure out what it was. From Johns Island, South Carolina. And he left him in 1779 or 7. I couldn't really read that. And then the last one is Tom Rivers, formerly slave to Coal Rivers. And it's something island, South Carolina, beginning in 1780. So you see there's a lot of really good information on those records. Now let's go back to that death certificate I gave you on page three in your handout, because that's a little easier. But do you see why you don't want to overlook records just because you think they may not have your person? And when you do look at a record, you don't just say, well, this is about this. And I'm not looking for that, so I don't need that, okay? Have y'all got that? If y'all don't get anything else out of this lecture, if y'all get that, I will be a happy camper, okay? All right, so on page three, we're looking at a death certificate. I just couldn't resist this one because it just was the first one that came up. I wasn't even doing a real search. Somebody had evidently searched for this recently when I went to Virtual Vault, and this one came up because you've got this death certificate, and I want you to look at what the information is on here. And again, I want you to identify the primary information and what is secondary. And then I want you to look at what is the direct evidence provided on this document. I'll give you a minute, and then I want you all to start hollering stuff out. You got to really read the whole thing. And there's several things on here that are interesting to me that I haven't seen before. <laughs> and look how many times. <laughs> like I said, I wasn't looking. I mean, this just was the first one when I opened the death certificates, I don't think I had put in any search terms, and this one just popped up, and I went, oh, this one is too good to miss. Multiple ones. Right? That's exactly one of the questions we need to ask, so. Hang on to that. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so we know the death, the cause of death is pretty much given because it's hard for somebody to survive six gunshot shot wounds. Um, and I'm not sure whether it's really six or four. That's one of the things I wanted clarity on because it says gunshot wounds four, and then it said in right breast, and then one wound in back, and then one wound in right arm. So, I mean, it's like, okay. And her, it gives the name of her husband and date of birth. But what are those things over there and those hash marks kind of behind that? Because it looked like they originally listed her name as age 35, uh, five months and 22 days. And I don't know, I don't understand that because usually that's pretty much a given. Um, so what else do y'all notice on this besides the, it, the fun part about the gunshot wounds? I mean, I'm not trying to make fun of this woman. I feel for her that, you know, because she died a hard, sudden death. But that's what I'm asking. What were those things hashtagged out? You know, who, what, what were those days? Did somebody think, think they were supposed to be giving Thomas Burson's? Death, I mean, birth date because it's right under his name. To me, see, this is one of those forms that it's like, okay, what are they really asking me for? That's one of the questions. That, good job. That is one of the major, the temporary certificate is one of the things that caught my attention immediately. It's like, I'm not sure I've ever seen a temporary certificate. And then who is this informant? Who is Ms. O. Heald? And several of you point, asked that question. And what relationship is, I mean, geographically in a city directory and maps, you would want to look for where Capital, 647 Capitol Avenue is versus, and who shot her? I mean, I'm sure all of us immediately assumed her husband, but that could be, you know, wrong. So are we going to look at newspapers? Because you know that this is going to be in the news. It looks like it. I can't imagine, because it says died suddenly. Well, yes, six gunshots would tend to do that to you. Huh? Lead poisoning. <laughs> and so we've got her, her mother's and father's names, her mother's maiden name. So who is this Ms. O'Heald? Did What's the husband up to? Did he shoot her? Is he involved? Was he home? I mean... Exactly, and if you notice on your handout, I've given you questions to answer. I want to know the primary and secondary information. I want you to think about what the direct evidence is. And then I have a whole list of questions I want you to come up. I want you to come up with at least 10 other places that you would look. And y'all have mentioned um, court records, police records, estate records, city directories, Coroner reports, who else? And several of you asked, who is Mrs. O. Heald? I mean, is it her sister? I mean, you know. And you ask about, is there another certificate issued later after an autopsy? Because you can't really tell whether one's really been done at the, or I couldn't anyway. Yes. And so, and you would think, and maybe since it was six gunshot wounds, they didn't think they needed any more information. Um, and
Right. And see, that's it. We don't know. And see, the informant probably wasn't filling it out. Somebody else was filling it out from information they dictated, my guess, because the handwriting is pretty consistent. Except for that really bad handwriting in that bottom right-hand corner. I mean, that, look, that looks like it's supposed to be the doctor. It's, it says, Paul Donahue Coroner. And, and his, either he was drunk or his handwriting, is, he had cerebral palsy or something, because that handwriting is not. And it's telling you that he was in the Flatiron Building, you know, there in Atlanta. So, I mean, there's a lot of interesting information, but do you see how many questions, if you look at this instead of just looking at for the death information, how many questions you can raise in your mind that can lead you to additional info? Okay? Evidently not. And that's another reason you're wondering about, I'm wondering about that temporary versus permanent. Exactly. Exactly. There are all kinds of questions raised here, but this one gives you a lot of options for a lot of records and documents. So when I stumbled across this, I went, serendipity. Somebody was looking out for me on this one. Yeah. And it really doesn't, I can't read what it says if it's really saying it. It looks like just an ink blur below it. But see, the handwriting except for the coroner and the local registrar is pretty good. We also know the funeral home. We know what cemetery she went to so we could go find the Records on Find My Grave, Billion Graves, those kinds of things probably, if Crestlawn doesn't have its own. And thing to be aware of, I learned recently about Atlanta cemeteries, is some of these were adjacent to privately owned cemeteries and changed names over time. So there is a genealogy to cemeteries in Atlanta as well. So I'm just telling you, so if you have Atlanta folks, keep that in mind. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I noticed. I noticed that it said um, War Department compiled service records of voluntary Union soldiers. Do they also have one of those for Confederate? Yes, and that's a point I neglected to make. I have it in my notes and missed it. Um, volunteers. Remember, I told y'all you had to be careful about understanding terminology. Volunteer didn't necessarily mean you volunteered. You could be drafted. A lot of the volunteers were draftees. Um, there's a set of books um, done by Broadfoot Publishing. They've done lots of incredible Civil War publications where they compiled information, which makes it easy to get to an index of this stuff that gives you the basic information. And you can find it in most good libraries, genealogy libraries. But they list, you know, they have like 30 or 40 volumes of the volunteer soldiers of the Union Army in the Civil War. That does not include any of the regular Army. People used to get really annoyed because they'd come in and they'd say, well, my ancestor was a colonel. And I went, this, he's regular Army if he's a colonel. You know, he is regular Army, you know. He is not a volunteer. This is the ones who were categories, categorized as volunteers, and many were volunteers. They went in, signed up, and went to war. But there were also lots of volunteers drafted, and we tend to think of volunteers as people who raise their hand and show up. That's not necessarily what that meant at that time. Remember, I keep harping on you've got to understand the place and time you're dealing with, and that's what I'm saying. What? Yes, 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 yes. 
Yes, the records are available. A lot of these records are available online. There are several databases. Family Search. Um, Y'all need to spend a lot of time playing in Family Search if you don't already because it is totally free and I'm not a member of the LDS Church. I just am cheap and lazy and I like really high, high quality that gives me a lot of information. So, um, you know, Family Search is great. And after the class I just taught for Ollie at UGA on the four big databases, I've decided MyHeritage.com is my favorite genealogy database because of all the features they offer that you don't know that you can't even see that are going on. And so, and they've done more to keep advancing. Ancestry I've gotten annoyed with because they've been putting more focus until the last six months or so on selling DNA kits instead and promoting that instead of improving their website and their searchability. I'm sorry, I'm biased. I want it fast, easy, and often. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Because we're over time, and I apologize to y'all. Okay. Thank y'all for coming. I hope you learned something. Pardon?